Uh, and thanks to everybody who's taken the time today to, uh, to watch this or, or with the recording. Um, this is an area that I have been looking into for, for two reasons. You know, the, the first is from, from a consulting standpoint, we've been working with a number of organizations who have concerns or come to us to say, hey, we've got concerns about our CI CD pipeline. A lot of times when they're moving a lot of CI CD stuff out to the cloud and the, you know, it's, hey, we have a concern about this. Can you take a look at the, uh, at what our build process looks like to make sure that we're not exposing data, that we're not allowing people in and whatnot. Um, and so uh, we've done a bunch of consulting around that, around that with a bunch of organizations as they evolve their CI CD practices. Uh, but also, as, as Martin mentioned, uh, you know, recently, I mean, up in for the last 20 years, I was the CTO at Denim Group. We were recently acquired by Coal Fire about three and a half, a little over three and a half months ago. Uh, and as part of that process, the, as part of the diligence process for that, um, you know, they went through and looked at the our ThreadFix platform. And so I had to get reintroduced to um, the uh, you know, kind of what our CI CD pipeline looked like and, and how all that uh, you know, how all that was. So that was really interesting to me just to, to, to really dig in and look at the process that we used. Um, and so those two things intersected to uh, this presentation talking about uh, some different things that I found interesting about this. Uh, so we'll talk again about uh, you know, what's your risk exposure uh, based on your build pipeline. Uh, we'll give a super brief uh, explanation or, or, or you know, talk about threat modeling, really just links out to other materials because of time. Uh, I'll talk about the concerns about the supporting infrastructure that runs this build process. Uh, and then uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll go through a really quickly, a, a pipeline threat model, just a, a template threat model um, that you can use, uh, you know, take back to your environment and potentially look. Uh, again, a lot of, we got a, a lot of questions uh, on the slide that you can use in your environment to ask questions uh, to understand more about it. And then talk about different ways to use it, both, again, internal facing to increase your security, as well as external facing from a vendor management standpoint. Uh, and then I, I have some, some discussion points that I will uh, present uh, so that uh, we can then argue about them in the Slack afterward. Um, so you know, there's, there's been a couple notable incidents in this space that leads to this being, again, a topic of, of interest out in the industry. You know, in the SolarWinds case, their uh, build infrastructure is serving the build infrastructure was compromised, uh, causing uh, integrity issues with the software. Uh, in Code, uh, Code Cove, they had a compromised container server that caused a uh, you know, improper changes to their tool that led to a bunch of issues. Uh, and, and, and this trend, I mean, these aren't the only two, this trend contributed to the uh, Biden administration executive order and other government activity in the space. And so it's tremendous uh, you know, for, for vendors out there, it's tremendous fear, uncertainty and doubt. Um, and, but for practitioners uh, or folks that are responsible uh, for the security of CI/CD pipelines is also a call to uh, you know, it's, it's it's also a call to action. Uh, you know, let's take a look at this potential exposure area that we might not have looked at before. And you know, there's like the challenges. There's kind of a fundamental disconnect. You know, I, I remember when I I mean I started my career as a developer probably 25 years ago, and I look at the advances we have made with version control, uh, you know, static analysis both for quality and security, you know, unit testing, acceptance testing, code coverage, like the tooling we have available now is so much better and so much easier to use than it was, you know, when I started at my career, you know, in the you know, mid to late nineties as a, as a, as a Java developer, right? There's, I mean, we have just amazing tools that put us in a situation where we should be able to create, you know, secure, reliable software at a, at a scale that previously hadn't been considered. Uh, you know, the flip side of that is that the way that we deploy and deliver this tooling puts us in a situation where you actually can't trust anything that comes out of the other end. Uh, oops, uh, yeah, is is really all I can uh, is, is really all I can say to that. Uh, and and especially like the deeper into this, or the more that I looked at this, what I really found is these build pipelines have fractal attack surface, right? Where we look and we see, okay, well, I see kind of the general shape. Well, if you zoom in on any of these shapes, you find like, oh, well, this shape actually has a level of complexity uh, where it's repeating a lot of the things before it has a level of complexity where that repeats. And if you zoom in even closer, you see that, you know, same complexity and zoom in and, and so on and so forth. And so that's really a challenge that we've found. And I'll talk about some of the sources of this, but if you just think about, we've got code, we've got open source components, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, you know 
you know, web hooks, we've got, uh, you know, GitHub actions, we've got, you know, you know, everything along the way has a plugin model and you don't necessarily know where those plugins are being pulled from unless you're being really careful. And so that's a real challenge with these CI CD pipelines is just, you know, the fractal attack surface that they expose that is, you know, that, you know can be an ever changing mess. So from a threat modeling standpoint, uh, again, it's just for time reasons, we don't really have time to, to, to dive deep into this. Um, you know, if you want some background, you can uh, you know, take a look. There's some resources out there that are available. Uh, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to break the parts of the CI CD pipeline and the build process down into pieces, watch how data flows between them and identify potential areas of exposure. And uh, again, we've got uh, there's a, a lot of questions that you can use to ask in your environment about the different stages and we'll outline different concerns um, along the way. So, you know, what's the, from a, just from a raw concern standpoint, like what are we worried about in the CICD pipeline? You know, the potential confidentiality impact of a breach in your CICD pipeline, uh, you know, IP disclosures, you know, organizations have algorithms that are subject to trade secret protection. Um, you know, there are, uh, you know, concerns about, uh, you know, again, the access to source code that people aren't supposed to have access to and whatnot. And, you know, if you see how, like, it's been interesting for me seeing how organizations from a legal standpoint will be very, very concerned about the open source licenses associated with their software because they don't wanna be forced to disclose the source by you know, including you know, GPL or other viral components, uh, but organizations are more lax about including components with security vulnerabilities. Um, and that's because that, you know, again, a concern about the value of that IP uh, so the, that's a, a big confidentiality concern. You know, obviously in the build process, you're going to have secrets, uh, you know, used for signing things and whatnot, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, and and if your source code is exposed, that puts you at a risk for vulnerability disclosure. Uh, you know, vulnerability data is not typically subject to re regulation, but it's obviously you know high value and sensitive information that no one wants to let outside of their walls in an uncontrolled manner. You know, when we look from an integrity standpoint, you know, the concerns are if someone can actually, instead of just being able to see what's going on in the build process, if they can affect it, uh, that's scary, uh, you know, because people can put in things like backdoors um, or other suspicious uh, or, you know, or, you know, that pr provides like surreptitious access. Uh, and you can also have other unwanted behaviors, uh, crypto mining, you know, DDoSing, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and again, just a general compromise of uh, parts along that build chain. From an availability standpoint, um, in most situations uh, that where, where, where we've worked with folks, this is less of a uh, you know, less of a concern. Um, you know, obviously, you, you know, you want to be able to build and deploy software. If you're delayed in doing that, that may have an impact, but probably not as acute as a confidentiality or integrity breach. Um, you know, one potential a situation where you would have availability concerns. You know, software today isn't just a monolith that runs. You know, your clients deployed software might depend on services that you're providing. And so an inability to update those for some period of time you know, may have uh, you know, may have a negative impact. Now, it's important first to think about the infrastructure supporting your CI CD pipeline, right? Are these fixed assets? Are these you know, bare metal servers or virtual servers that live for a long time? Or are these ephemeral assets, you know, virtual servers that pop up and pop down or containers that spin up and spin down? You know, and how does that fit into your scanning regimen? You know, one thing we've found in a number of organizations is a lot of dev infrastructure is managed by developers. And so it may not be in scope for the corporate you know, scanning and patching uh, regimens that they have in place. Um, and that is, you know, the developers tend to like this because it gives them the ability to kind of own their uh, you know, own their situation, which is great. Uh, it's, it's potentially though risky because you don't have, if you're used to having these detection and controls and kind of mitigations in place for the rest of your infrastructure, you know, when you look at your CI CD infrastructure, like that's, there's a lot of really valuable and sensitive stuff that flows through that. And so, uh, you know, to not have those practices in place uh, is scary. Um, and, uh, you know, infrastructure as code can be a help in this, but also, you know, can, can also be an area that exposes you to risk. And so it's important to ask questions. You know, if you're, if you're going to talk to the folks, your DevSecOps folks responsible for their pipelines, you know, start by understanding what does this support infrastructure look like? Where does this stuff live? And how are these normal information security practices being implemented for that? Another challenge, a real challenge with modern tooling is like the perimeter is a freaking nightmare, right? <clears throat> you know, it's a you know, critical part of the threat modeling process is to understand like, well, what's in scope and what's out of scope. And for 
for, for modern CI CD pipelines that are using a lot of the cool tooling that's available, this turns out to be extremely, extremely difficult, you know, and often impossible to find the boundary. Uh, there's a lot of steps, a lot of moving parts, and what it looks like today may not be what it looks like later, right? And especially as I talked about, you know, you've got uh, actions and apps and everything has an extension uh, you know, plugin mechanism, you know, those plugins get loaded from who knows where, um, you know, you, you could be running code from almost anywhere and that code running from anywhere and less constrained is potentially going to send you know, you know, your code uh, elsewhere for analysis, for archiving, for uh, whatever that you know, might be. And uh, you know, so, so you don't necessarily know unless you've looked at it uh, where your data is going. And, and a real challenge here uh, for, for a lot of security teams to understand, like if you look at how most security tools get purchased, uh, it's kind of a, a, a big box, like a monolithic evaluation, proof of concept, procurement, deployment, right? And you've got this big security you know, scanner tool or whatever it is like doing stuff. Um, if you look at how dev tools get implemented, like it's very different. You know, a lot of the dev tools are you know, freely available or they have freemium models where you kind of, you know, just by having a GitHub account, like all of a sudden anybody with a GitHub account is a corporate purchasing agent uh, where they're bringing, you know, you know, spinning up new tools in the CI CD pipeline. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that's scary to a lot of security folks, but that's just normal for development teams. They say like, you know, hey, I found this uh, you know, neat new code coverage tool that we're going to use. And as long as we don't use it for more than five projects, it's free. Uh, you know, I can, I can load it up here from GitHub, right? And most organizations don't have great controls around those. Uh, and, and, and honestly, it's not easy to implement those types of controls. And so one of the things, one of the, one of the approaches, I tried two different approaches uh, or two different things that I looked at when we were uh, when we kind of dug into this. You know, the first thing I tried, well, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's just uh, watch the net flow data of the build process, right? Like that would be interesting because we could see like where, where should this build process be able to talk and not be able to talk. And, you know, maybe we could put firewall rules around it or something. I had this like, great idea like, oh, yeah, we're just going to put a wrapper around the process and make sure it only does the stuff it's supposed to do. Like I, I watched a couple of different software products and the NetFlow data around that, and it was, they, they talked to everything, right? It just simply wasn't reasonable to sort through that data and figure out, you know, there was so much traffic to so many endpoints that like, you know, how, how are you supposed to know what's the right stuff to look at or not? Um, so what I, like an, an approach that, 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 that I've used and that we've used in other environments that has had a lot of success is, well, let's start with a code commit and follow, like walk me through the workflow, right? And I know this, I mean, it sucks because you actually have to talk to people and ask questions and, and get their answers. Um, that's less convenient than having like a neat uh, NetFlow firewall model to do things. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> again, uh, that, that was something that I found that worked. And so if you look at an example, CI, CD pipeline data flow, again, everybody's is, uh, you know, every, every product is going to be different or every, you know, applications is going to be different. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, but this is kind of, a, you know, the idea you, you've got your developer, they're committing code to a repository, you're pulling open source components, you build that into a binary, you know, that binary gets run through a variety of different tests, you make some sort of an evaluation. Uh, if the build passes, then that gets passed into some sort of a build repository and then distributed out to others, right? That's a, a again, your, your, your process may have different steps, may have different controls, um, but this is at least a template that you can work from, uh, you know, augment and, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of uh, you know, customize it for your environment. You know, and so what do we, what do we want to do? Again, talk through the code change, you know, change the code, run the build, um, you know, automated uh, testing, accept or deny, uh, push to distribution and, just, and, and actually distribute the software. And as you're working with folks in your environment, you, know, you want to ask questions at each stage, right? And, and like two really important questions that, that I've found to ask are, well, how does this step authenticate itself to the next step, right? Like how does this component let the next component know like, you know, who it is, what it's doing, like why, well, what sort of access it's supposed to have, right? Like how do the steps you know, go from one to the next? Um, because that identifies a lot of potential concerns. Uh, and also answer me a simple question, where is the server, <laughs> right? Like where is the server or services that is performing this step, right? Like where, where does the data have to go and where is the code gonna run that's actually going to perform this, uh, this, this action before moving on to the next one? 
And you know, this is also, this should be a show activity, not a tell activity, right? You want to be, you know, show me the screen, like show me the user interface, you know, show me like evidence of why you think this is behaving as it is, because that's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not always, uh, you know, it's, it's not always obvious. Now, some general overarching concerns. There's a tremendous amount of network traffic that goes into this, again, from the NetFlow example. Uh, you know, how is that traffic being protected? Um, you know, again, you know, like, let's make sure that we've got TLS in place to guard confidentiality and integrity. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of authentication points where you have, uh, you know, you have users authenticating themselves to systems to do different activities, but you also, uh, you know, along that build process, you've got systems authenticating themselves to one another. Uh, you know, how, you know, just understand the mechanics. How is that happening? And do you have an overarching, you know, uh, you know identity and access management paradigm in place? Or more likely, is there some sort of combination of overlapping approaches of how these pieces all fit together you know, with their credentialing? You know, also data storage. You know, how is data at rest protected if it needs to be? Uh, you know, for, for you know, especially for like file and block storage. Um, you know, and what are your uh, you know, what are your unknown unknowns, right? Like where 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 are you identifying things as you as you talk through this with a DevSecOps engineer? Where are the places where you get the, you know, the what we call the two shoulder salute? Like you ask a question, they say, eh? <laughs> um, you know, and again, like a challenge here is like any developer with a GitHub account is now potentially their own purchasing agent, which is a, uh, you know, for a lot of security practitioners is really a terrifying uh, concern. So if we look at some you know, specific concerns about source repository workflow engines, oops, um, yeah. uh, you know, so you've got sources of code, uh, you know, stuff that you're writing in-house with uh, in-house developers, as well as potentially third-party development teams. You know, what does it look like for that code to get into the system, right? You know, are, are merge requests being reviewed by one or more uh, you know, other developers? Uh, you know, how, how do, what does it take for code to get into the system? Uh, and also, you know, how do third-party development teams get their code into the environment? And a pattern that we've seen in a number of cases and that we've used is to have uh, multiple, like a, 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 a bastion host Git repository or a proxy Git repository where less trusted developers put code, you know, they can do, you know, go through their whole process. And then before that code makes it into the main code base, it can go through a more elaborate uh, again, checking for security vulnerabilities, checking for potential backdoors, but it's a very explicit uh, step to say we're going to take this less trusted code from uh, you know, from a third party and bring that into our environment. Uh, and so that's something to uh, uh, you know that's one technique to potentially look at. But, but you need to understand like what what checks are placed before code finds itself in the repository. <clears throat> You know, and you know, a really interesting question that I uh, that I dug into with some folks is authentication. Like, how do people authenticate to these repositories, right? Uh, you know, are developers uh, like what do they? How do they authenticate to push and pull code? Are they using certificates for that or some some other means, right? How do developers log into the user interface to evaluate merge requests, right? How do external systems call into APIs? And so, what you can find is a situation where the source code repository has certificates, uh, you know, being used for certain types of access, usernames and passwords. Maybe they go back to LDAP or AD. Uh, maybe you have API tokens. And so, like with that's a scary situation to be in, where hey, to authenticate to the system, there's these different ways to do it. Uh, you know, and, and again, looking at you know what other hosted repositories and workflow, you know, have you, do you have things configured where they're going to run different apps, different actions, you know, integration for GitLab, you know, all these external collaborators. And so it's important to kind of dig in and understand how do people access this? Well, how do they do, you know, again, how do you do code? How do you like access the user interface? How does API, how do API or other components talk to this? You know, when you look at the open source component management, a question you've got there is, are you pulling these components directly from the central repositories or are you proxying through some sort of a service that allows you to enforce policies, right? <clears throat> Where you can say like, hey, we're not gonna allow things with certain licenses. We're not gonna allow things that have uh, you know, known vulnerabilities at a certain level or something like that. Uh, so that's another choke point where you have some control. Um, where it's uh, you know, where, where it can be important to uh, you know, understand what controls you have in place, and that's again, if you're pulling directly from central repositories, there are a number of products out there that'll give you some control over this. 
uh, you know, a lot of organizations we talk to have concerns about open source backdoors. None of them have the resources to actually maintain this themselves, to, to check this themselves, right? You know, again, problems with PHP or concerns with PHP, Linux kernel example, uh, where people were like intentionally submitting security vulnerabilities, like write a paper, like, come on, jerks. Like, <laughs> um, and so this in a lot of cases isn't realistic to detect, but it is important to be able to respond. And so if you have good practices around open source management, you should be able to know Again, uh, software bill of materials, things like that nature. Hey, what components do we have in there? Uh oh, we know that you know the backdoor has been disclosed. Let's go identify how that actually impacts us, and so that we can go back through the process of getting a, 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 an improved build out. Now, if we look at the build management systems, <clears throat> right? You know, it's a question. You're you're combining again. You've got your source code. You're pulling in these external components. Uh, you know, to combine that and create a new build. And, and how do those get run? Are those run on every merge request? Are they run on accepted merge requests? Um, you know, are they only run on specific branches and tags? It's important to understand, you know, like, how do you, like, how do these systems get initiated? And that was something when I dug into, uh, you know, to our you know, environment, like I, I learned some things about what we were doing that I didn't expect. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's good, nothing nefarious, but it was, you know, for, you know, I was able to understand like, oh, well, you know, GitLab, kicks off on these types of things and Jenkins you know, only weighs in on other types of things, right? Uh, a, a total nightmare is Maven plugins, right? Like that's another source of code that you can't trust. It's going to run in your environment. That's going to get pulled from, you know, re repositories out in the middle of uh, who knows where, right? Like that's really scary. Again, all of the plugin capabilities um, in these build management tools or, or tools along the tool chain uh, makes it really challenging to understand like what is actually being run. Then if we look at automated testing, uh, again, unit te testing, acceptance testing, you know, all, you know, all types of new, you know, static analysis and things like that. Uh, that's great, right? For static analysis, like what's being analyzed, source or binary, where is that being performed? Is it performed in your environment or is that, is an artifact being sent out to a cloud environment for that processing? You know, there's no wrong answer there, but you want to know the answer. That's the important thing, right? Where are the results being stored? Are those stored in your environment or are those stored on some external server uh, you know, for, for a cloud provider? Again, no wrong answer, but you need to have an answer. Uh, same thing with dynamic testing. You know, where is the server that is being tested hosted? Uh, you know, where is the test track that traffic being generated? You know, what does it pass through such that people might be observed or modify that? And where are those, uh, where are those results being stored? Uh, you know, same questions for IaaS software composition analysis. Again, like where's where's the data moved to uh, for the processing? Where are the results being stored? Um, you know, I, I have to give a, a, a shout out. Uh, there's a lot of concerns about backdoors. And like one of the most interesting talks I saw was a long time ago when OWASP had their conference at the eBay headquarters like a million years ago. Uh, and I saw Chris Wysopo give a talk about the uh, about like automated backdoor detection. Um, and so that's something that is, uh, and, and he gave some examples of open source uh, or open source or disclosed applications. Like, hey, if you search for this pattern, you can potentially find this nefarious behavior. Like, you know, first of all, like from a backdoor standpoint, the easiest way to insert a backdoor often is to have a bad person uh, introduce a security vulnerability because that gives them deniability. What I'm talking about more from this backdoor detection is, you know, how do you look at the behavior of the application to identify hard coded credentials, you know, something, uh, you know, something of that nature. Um, I think this is a, a really, it's, well, it's an impossible problem to solve. And it's a, a really challenging problem to like even reasonably solve at scale, um, but uh, yeah, I think that's an area of potential, you know, of, of potential of, of, of interest. Now, if we look at the software getting packaged and distributed, like what does that look like? Uh, you know, you've got uh, you know, monolithic applications, microservices applications. What are you actually distributing? Uh, you know, code signing is great uh, if you're using it. That's fantastic, um, but that doesn't solve the problems of backdoors or vulnerable code or other issues because you know it, it merely like freezes in time and blesses what's come through the process. If you've had problems earlier in the process, you know this packaging and and you know onto distribution. Um, you know there are uh, you know you, you may just be baking in problems that you had uh, you know, that you had before. And then finally for the distribution, you know, how is that, how is this being distributed? Are you distributing binary? Are you distributing containers? Are these containers that get pulled from a container repository? Again, asking this question, where are these containers hosted? How are they signed? You know, 
you know, they're, are they being pulled uh, over in a network uh, manner that is, uh, you know, that, that you know, like helps to prevent, uh, you know, tampering and things of that nature. Right, and so that's kind of a speed run through the different steps in the process. And again, there's, uh, there's, uh, you'll pull the slides and, and, and take a look. Um, but those are some concerns to look at along the way and, and some areas that I've found are good to highlight. I know. So how do we use this threat model? Uh, you know, by building off this threat model, you can identify where are the gaps in your own pipeline. Uh, you know, you know what, what can you shore up? Are you pulling open source components uh, in a way? Uh, are you pulling open source components in a way that you don't have the ability to put a lot of controls on those? Um, you know, or are you able to implement policies in the, in, the, in those places, right? You know, and a lot of stuff you're gonna you're gonna find that you have to live with, right? You know, the uh, like the best way for security to get marginalized is to slow down the development teams that are working on key strategic initiatives, right? Uh, and so there are you know, a lot of scary things in modern CI CD pipelines that security folks just have to live with. Um, you know, but it's also, again, knowing about what your exposure looks like, knowing areas of potential weakness, you know, that puts you in a situation where if you suspect there might be an issue, uh, you know, that you can have a response plan. What do we do if we find out that we've accidentally included a component with a backdoor, right? What do we do if we find out that, you know, what's the implication if we find out that a build server, you know, a long-lived virtual machine, uh, you know, has had some sort of a compromise, you know, how does that flow downstream? Right, that, that's a lot better to know before there's a problem than once there is a problem. And this is also something where you can have meaningful conversations with the suppliers of the software. Right, when you look at you know, when you look at vetting uh, you know, from a supply chain standpoint, there's kind of two things that you can look at. You can either well, you can you can both look at, or the two things you can look at. You know, one is let's look at the application and you know, the current version of the application will do some testing identify potential vulnerabilities and then potentially kick that back to the vendor and say you know until you fix this stuff we're not going to buy the software or you know you have some, some sort of a service level agreement that you have to fix this stuff um, you know but you can also look at people's practices to understand you know from an open sam or oasp sam standpoint they, you know, talk to me about what practices you have in place um, and you can ask questions like hey tell me about what your build process looks like okay it all runs in the cloud great what controls do you have in place to make sure that developers aren't including risky scary stuff <laughs> Uh, you know, again, from vendor management, uh, all the uh, the code cuff stuff, uh, you know, like everybody all of a sudden is like, oh, no, like, hey, all right, hey, are all our, any of our vendors using code cuff? And let's go like freak out about those folks. And then you ask the question, wait a minute, are we using code cuff? Because <laughs> maybe we've got something that we need to, you know, to deal with our, our, ourselves. Uh, so I've, I've identified four potential, uh, argue, no, sorry, discussion points for the uh, Slack discussion. Uh, software bill of materials, great idea, or literally the least we can do for supply chain security. Uh, also looking at uh, you know, developers versus security tools, how do developers get access to such cool stuff so easily? Uh, you know, there's been talk about parallel build pipelines. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> Hard enough to build one pipeline. Now we're going to build and manage two. Uh, and uh, backdoor detection, is there any, uh, any way to do this at scale? Uh, so now I think we're right about on time, and uh, Martin is uh, probably about ready to play the music and use the, the hook to pull me off stage, but I'll hop over to the uh, Slack channel and looking forward to hopefully talking to some folks there. <laughs>